On this episode, my guest is B. Blozer, author of Vaccines and Bayonets, plus murder in Las Vegas and breaking news on the shocking suspect arrest. Also, Florida man loses his arm to a gator. All this and more on today's Open Highway. The Open Highway with Eric Erickson. Hello, everybody, and welcome to The Open Highway. I'm your host, Eric Erickson. Thank you so much, as always, for joining me. It's uh, been a crazy day here. I am coming to you from the state of California, otherwise known as the surface of the sun. Uh, If you haven't heard, we are facing some just incredible temperatures here, Uh, record-breaking temperatures. Sacramento saw 116 degrees, which broke a 97-year-old record, and it is just affecting everyone up and down the state. Um, We have flex alerts. We have rolling brownouts and blackout threats. Um, It's just crazy. We're hearing from the governor constantly asking us to turn off our power and uh, do what we can to conserve. And um, it's just been, well, it's been a week of, uh, it's just fucking hot. (laughs) It's just hot. But um, that's not the only thing in the news. Um, I'm going to get right to it. But my guest today is B. Blozer. She's the author of Vaccines and Bayonets, and she's going to talk to us about her fascinating story of working in foreign countries, uh, bringing vaccines to the needy. It's an incredible story. You are going to love it. But first of all, let's get to it. It's time for the news. So you probably have heard about the murder of Jeff German. Uh, I wrote a Substack article on it the other day about, uh, if you haven't heard, he was a 69-year-old beat reporter. His beat was politics, corruption, crime in Las Vegas. He was well-known for breaking stories, bringing corrupt politicians to justice. Uh, He wrote a series of exclusive stories on the strip shooting, which forced uh, changes in security because uh, it brought to light all of these issues. Well, he was murdered uh, the other day outside of his house. He was found stabbed. And um, since I wrote the Substack, since I, I was, I record the show the day before it releases. So you're listening to it on Thursday or you're listening to it afterwards. I'm recording it Wednesday night. And just as I was getting ready to record it, the news hit that they have arrested a suspect. So <clears throat> they were originally, they released some photos of somebody in a straw hat and with this orange, weird orange like construction suit. It was a really bizarre photo if you looked at it. It was somebody who was definitely trying not to be seen or, or recognized. Um, so initially he was found at about 10.30 in the morning and a neighbor found him lying outside the house. Well, today, Right as I came in to record the show, um, earlier today they released that they had arrested a suspect and nobody knew who it was. Uh, They wouldn't confirm who it was, but the uh, Las Vegas Review Journal has been doing some incredible reporting because he was a reporter for the Las Vegas Review Journal. He had worked for The Sun before that. Um, Decades of experience uh, working the beat. Um, It turns out they had raided the house of a Clark County public administrator named Robert Tellez. Robert Tellez um, was being investigated by German. He was writing a series of articles about him. He had written some articles about uh, that he created a hostile work environment, that he had mismanaged uh, some parts of his job. He was having an affair with a female worker. Um, but the 45-year-old Democrat Tellez, uh, he has now been arrested for German's murder, which this is incredible. I was a crime reporter in Chicago. This is a town where this kind of stuff at one point was normal. You know, um, even Vegas in this day and age, this is incredible. This is going to be a huge story once it comes out. Um, you know, people are starting to talk about 
tell as they're being interviewed and you're hearing the same things you always hear. He seemed like a nice guy. He seemed like an honest guy. He was part of the rotary. He, he had a background check. He never, he never had a run in with the law. You know, he was this, you know, upstanding guy. And now he is in custody for the murder of Jeff German, which is just an incredible story. Um, at first, I wrote the Substack article at first because I, as a journalist, you know, I, I'm touched by the, the, what I thought and everybody else thought at first was random violence, uh, just unfortunate violence that he got caught up in. Although there were, you know, murmurs of what if it was coming for one of his articles, but his editor was quoted, uh, his editor at the Review Journal was quoted as saying that, that German hadn't come to him with any uh, cause for fear. He didn't feel that he had received any threats. He wasn't worried about it. Um, so when this hit today, I mean, this is crazy. This is just insane. This is like something you would have heard out of like Goodfellas or back in Chicago, like Al Capone kind of thing. Um, so the details on this are just going to be fascinating. This is gonna be a hell of a trial, hell of a trial when this hits. Um, that would be an amazing trial to cover as a reporter that would just be an insane um so yeah like they towed his car they were he was out washing his his he had a gmc yukon and they had id'd it and he was out washing it and then there was apparently when the swat teams rolled up according to reporting swat teams rolled up and there was an hour-long standoff with tellas and then when they finally got him and again details are still coming out uh, if you're interested in this, uh, the links are in the show notes to what I have now, but I'm sure there'll be more coming out every day. There was an hour long standoff and there's no reports that I found so far of gunfire or anything like that, but he was put in a stretcher and taken away in an ambulance. So um, I don't like to con uh, offer conjecture because you know, you know you want the facts. It could be any number of reasons. He could have could be medical. It could be self-inflicted. It could be anything, but these facts are going to come out. But it's just amazing, just amazing the the turn that this has taken um, in a weird way. And, and I don't mean to be dark about this, but in a weird way, isn't it fitting? Like this German is legendary at this point. I mean, he was legendary for the work that he did. But to go out that way, it's just, it's cinematic. And it's just so sad. But um, I'm definitely going to be following this. Uh, I wrote an article about him on Substack. Check that out if you want more. Um, I would highly advise uh, following the Review Journal's reporting on this. Because obviously he's one of theirs and they are on this. Um, so it's just, uh, it's an incredible story. So, uh, in the sake of full disclosure, I, in the exact same episode, have to make a correction. Um, I have been pronouncing uh, the reporter who was murdered in Vegas' name incorrectly. It's actually Jeff Gearman. Uh, I did not know that because everything that I'd seen, I had read. And uh, while this was being buffered out... I actually was watching a news report and his name was pronounced correctly. So my apologies for that. I take responsibility for it. I guess I'm just print. And sometimes when you are a slave to the print, you got to make up your own pronunciations of, of how people's names are. So my apologies for that. So the Trump saga continues. Is it saga or saga? I guess it, you know... I guess it depends where you are in the country. So I, I've said it both ways, but I'm going to go with saga. Uh, the Trump saga continues. Um, they're coming out now. He claims that he, he he came out publicly and said, I never had any nuclear stuff. And now they're coming out and saying, well, actually, yeah, we some of the documents are nuclear. He got his, uh, his master to look over things, um, which is going to take a while because they now they need to find somebody who is – cleared for top secret information and also is is qualified to do this so this is going to just drag on but there's been there's been an interesting turn in New Mexico of all places 
So a, a judge in New Mexico ruled that Coy Griffin, and I, I think it's Coy, C-O-U-Y. I haven't heard it pronounced, but he's an Otero County commissioner. And I used to be a reporter in New Mexico, so I know, you know, these little, these little counties. Um, very conservative, very red areas. And uh, he was part of a group. He's the founder of the group Cowboys for Trump. And he was a Otero County commissioner. And a judge disqualified him from holding public office because of his participation in the January 6th riot, insurrection, whatever you want to call it. It wasn't a tour group. I don't care what anybody says. But um, he's been disqualified from uh, holding public office. Now, not that surprising, although it is the first time that an elected official has been ordered to be removed from office because of their participation or support of the riot. And they're, they're still looking into it and, and everything. But because if you know me, you know this is what I find interesting. Um, the article is by Caitlin Dixon. And she put in a very interesting passage. And I think this is where the lead is buried. And I'm going to read it. I'm going to quote it right here. Some legal experts predicted that Tuesday's ruling could have serious implications for other current or former officials, including Trump himself, who were involved in January 6th and maybe hoping to return to government. If this stands up on appeal, then it's a significant precedent for the next election cycle, said a constitutional scholar and professor at Indiana University. So, and to go on, uh, quote, the most obvious way in which that works is if Mr. Griffin is disqualified for what he did on January 6th, why isn't Donald Trump disqualified for what he did on January 6th, which was greater? That, I think, is the interesting part of this article and this story, because they're right. I'm not an attorney. I never pretend to be one, but they're absolutely right. This sets precedence for involvement in a quote unquote insurrection, which again, everyone debates on both sides. I've heard liberals, I've heard conservatives, I've heard middle of the road people debate what it really was, what it was called. That's not what I'm talking about. But if your involvement in this situation disqualifies you for office, that sets a precedence. If Trump was involved in this, then doesn't that disqualify him for office? And then what about that's come out that there were certain officials, certain Congress people, senators who were also involved, who gave tours, who opened doors, who did all of that? Is that involvement? If that's involvement, doesn't that disqualify them from office? So as we all kind of chuckle at the January 6th committee and even Democrats and people on the left are getting to the point where they're like, why are we even doing this? Uh, there is a question out of all of this, what does involvement mean? And now there is a precedent. So that's what I find interesting in that story. And you know me, if I find it interesting, I bring it to you. Oh, it's that time. It's that time. You know what it is. Yeah. Let's go down to Florida. Florida is situated in the south of the United States. Great state of Florida. In Florida. People of Florida. Florida, man. Florida. 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 It's Florida. So... Usually we pick on people from Florida. We say the, oh my God, goofballs, whatever. But this one, I'm actually, I actually feel for this dude. Um, this guy, well, let me, let me let him explain it to you. This evening, we are hearing for the first time from that guy who lost his arm in an alligator attack in Mayaka City earlier this summer. Yeah, it's a story that you're only going to see here on 10 Tampa Bay. He is sharing his story. At least a half dozen gator attacks this season around the Tampa Bay area. Eric Murda is one of those who lived to tell his story. I look over and there's a gator on my right hand side. So I went to swim and she got she got my forearm. So I grabbed her like this and 
like she's trying to roll, but she snapped her head, so, so my arm went backwards like this completely. He says he fought for his life. She drug me under three times. She's already got my arm. So, so when I, we came up the third time, she finally did her death roll and took off with my arm. And that's just where his story begins. Okay, isn't it crazy? <laughs> All right, so his name is Eric Murda. He's 43, he's from Sarasota, Florida. So he's out visiting a, a fish camp when he got lost. And he opted to swim across the lake as opposed to walking around. All right, maybe not the smartest decision that he could have made. Oh wait, he quoted that, he's quoted as saying that. Not the smartest decision a Florida boy can make. So yeah, like he said, he was out there and he got bit by this gator and it, the gator got part of his forearm. And uh, the crazy part is, so he lives, right? He lives, the, he, he survives the attack. Amazing. But that's not where it ends. Three days. He's, he's going through the wilderness for three days with this injury. So he, he finally, he finds this guy. He comes across a fence and there's a guy on the other side. And he says, I said a gator got me arm, he said. Holy smokes, man. <laughs> so that's how they met. <laughs> so the guy helps him. Uh, they haven't named the hero, but I mean, this, this, this dude should get some total honor for helping this guy. Um, they cut the fence. They bring him over. He walks up to the ambulance, and they fly him to the local hospital where they amputated the remains of his arm. So just to wrap up this story, or maybe the tail end of it, uh, pun completely intended. Um, so apparently they have nuisance alligator hunters. So if you were with us a few weeks ago, you remember my interview with Amy Siwi, who does the same thing with pythons. So they have nuisance alligator hunters who don't get paid. Uh, they basically get to keep the, the meat and the leather, and that's how they make their living. Um, so they sent one of these nuisance hunters out there, but according to reports, they couldn't find anything. But, man, it's it's fun to do a story where it's not about how stupid he was. It was just that he was in the wrong place, the wrong time. Maybe he made a bad choice trying to swim for it, but hey, who wouldn't, you know? Except for the fact that there's gators in the water. But what can you do? But anyway, that's it for the news. It's horrid. All right, let's get to my guest, B. Blozer. She is the author of Vaccines and Bayonets. This is an incredible interview. She is a fascinating woman. We are going to talk about her time uh, working with her late husband, vaccinating people in some very, very, very interesting countries. I think this story deserves the three varies. So I'm okay with that. I've been working on that, but sometimes you just got to throw in a couple extra berries. So without further ado, B. Blozer. The, the whole idea of the show comes from road trips and the idea of sitting at the counter at a diner and seeing who you end up talking to and learning new things. So uh, I think you yeah. actually fit in with that really well. You, you start in Oklahoma and you end up in Africa. <laughs> right. How, how does that, how does a, how does a girl from Oklahoma where, where I've worked? So I know the state, but how do you end up in Africa? I had wanted to go to Africa from the time I was, well, the first recording of it is in my diary when I was 10 years old mm -hmm. and um, uh, that I wanted to go to Africa. And I of course had these film strip uh, images in my head. And, uh, and then after graduation from college, I went on a blind date with a guy named Carl Blozer, and he didn't wait past the second date to tell me that his dream was to work in medical missions, and we married six months later. Oh, <laughs> that's so sweet. And then... And <laughs> You know, and then he his, sweeps you off to another continent. <laughs> <laughs> well, his 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 uh, love was international health, global health, mm -hmm. and uh, so 
he rightly assessed that we were kindred spirits and uh, so the rest is history <laughs> so so you end up you go to um uh africa you end up there you're fighting smallpox right you're actually there yeah. with vaccinations for smallpox how does that happen? Does Carl is is Carl involved in that? And then you yes, are yes, an observer he, at the time? Uh no, no. Uh we went as a family. We the, the children and I went because we were there with him, you know. Mm -hmm. Uh but he was the one who was vaccinating and training vaccination teams and and doing assessments and all operations. He was an operations officer. And um, so they, uh, but, you know, we went as a family um, and were, lived there for two years. And you ended, and where were you? Which, let's establish the country, because so much interesting happens. So what country are you in? Right. We were first in Northern Nigeria, kind of on the Southern edge of the apron of the Sahara. Mm -hmm in the African Sahel, and that was a Muslim area. Uh, so, you know, you had the uh, indigo blue robed uh, warriors and all that sort of thing, um, <clears throat> and sand, uh, wall to, you know, horizon to horizon beige, and, um, then we were transferred from, we expected to be in Kano, Nigeria for two years. And then Equatorial Guinea became independent and they wanted the program there and CDC needed to find someone who was already in West Africa and already trained and could speak Spanish to go there. That was a, uh, that was a former Spanish colony Spain's only colony in Sub-Saharan Africa. So Carl agreed to go. And um, so that was. Uh, um, what, what was your what was your first impression when you got there? Because I mean, you, how old are you at this time? Oh, I was 31. OK, so you had a, you had a few years of experience, but what was your impression i mean this must have been a very foreign land especially at that time there wasn't as much you know we didn't have the internet yet we didn't have a lot of like you said you had film strips you had film yeah, strips of these yeah, exactly. film strips and uh yeah we didn't have a telephone and uh, carl's communications with the embassy in lagos or this is back in in northern nigeria mm -hmm. our first posting um you know he would have to go out to another site where they would they would send it um a cable i think and um so i the thing is i was just enthralled with all of it i was fascinated by everything i was thrilled to be there and um i sometimes say other oklahoma girls wanted to go to dallas I wanted to go to Africa, <laughs> and uh, uh, so I was. I was thrilled to be there. The um, there were there were hard things to see. Uh, seeing someone with severe someone who has survived smallpox but is so disfigured and uh, covered with the horrendous scars. It's hard for people to imagine, and you can't unsee that. It, it's just uh it's it's hard to to think about even and there was uh we saw a mass grave where tens of thousands possibly of one tribe had been massacred by another three years earlier um so there were some tough things but at the same time there were all the fascinating things of a different culture and um so that was that was fabulous in many ways when we were transferred to equatorial guinea um 
at the outset, I thought, oh, wow. But this looks like a Hollywood set, this beautiful tropical island. The capital of Equatorial Guinea was on this island. Um, there's a little piece of mainland and, and the island capital and another little island. The whole of Equatorial Guinea could fit inside the state of Maryland and have a little wiggle room left over. And, uh, but it was, it was just gorgeous and um, it took a while to find out that all of that beauty camouflaged or hid all the horrible atrocities, torture, murder, and everything that the dictator was dishing out on his people. Right. And the name of your book is Vaccines and Bayonets. So you address right in the title, not just the work that you did, but the violence that you saw. When did it... Uh, and, the, and the subtitle, which tells, you know, really describes the book as uh, the subtitle is Fighting Smallpox in Africa Amid Tribalism, Terror, and the Cold War. Mm. And the, the regime of this dictator who was in power in Equatorial Guinea, it became referred to as the terror. Mm -hmm. When did you start to see that? When did you start to realize that not everything was what it appeared? Carl had had... Um, a glimpse of what was going on uh, after all of our things were packed to transfer to Kano. And it was eight days, I think, before we were to leave to go to Equatorial Guinea. Uh, a cable came in uh, or telegram from the embassy in Lagos saying, you need to fly down here and spend a couple of days in the embassy in the cable room looking, reading through the cable traffic that's coming out of our embassy in Equatorial Guinea. And so he did and, and found out about all of this, that uh, Macias and Gema was um, inflicting on, on his people. Mm -hmm. But they, we kept hearing this phrase, but calm is largely restored and so he decided to fly down there and take a look himself and talk to the diplomats and the UN advisors, uh, UN people who were there, and then make a decision. Uh, the State Department said, we just, you know, you need to know this and then let us know, are you still willing to go there and take your family? Hmm. And um, so... The people on the ground there reassured him, oh, we, you know, it's much better now and uh, uh, for, for Americans and for, for foreigners, uh, not, not much better for, for the local people. Yeah. So he decided that it was going to be safe. They assured, assured him we would be safe and we went. And um, I guess... Um, one of the earliest chapters in my book is uh, or in the, that section of the book after we're transferred to Equatorial Guinea <clears throat> is, um, I think the title of it is Eerie Silence or something like that. So I took the, our two young children, they were, our son was four and our daughter was 18 months when we moved to West Africa. And uh, we set out to this tiny little this capital city is about one square mile. And we were gonna walk a few blocks to through the stores, uh, stop at the grocery store and just wanted to explore and see what was there. And it was so quiet. I mean, in Africa, you, you know, we're used to all the hustle and bustle and, and bells and shouting and music and, and uh, just, you know, the sounds of life, everybody, so much of life occurs outside and, and, uh, and it was so quiet and there was almost nobody on the street, almost nobody walked into, and the stores, some were boarded up, uh, 
the ones that were open had meager supplies on the shelves and I didn't see any other shoppers. And finally, a couple of people in the grocery store um, and the, the clerks in a few stores who were open, they, they barely spoke and it was eerie. And so I asked the ambassador and the, you know, the other people at the at dinner that evening, what's going on? And just abject fear had emptied the streets. Mm -hmm. uh, people would be snatched up and imprisoned, sent off to Black Beach Prison, which is one of the worst in the world, or certainly in Africa. And um, uh, so it, it was very soon apparent. And our second day, my second day there, we were being given a tour. The ambassador and, uh, and the chief of mission in Equatorial Guinea as a two-person embassy. And the ambassador was accredited to Equatorial Guinea as well as his resident post in Cameroon. And he was over there for his quarterly visit. And so we were, uh, Carl and I, and, and the two embassy people were being given a tour of City Hall. And the mayor was giving us the tour and, and very proud of showing us everything. And uh, all of a sudden, somebody came to the door and called him away. And when he came back, he said, I'm sorry, but the president has has just fired me and he was led away and and in the uh, discussion afterwards our people our embassy people said he would probably be severely beaten you know for he had somehow displeased the president he and, had just done something yeah you never so, know how did you feel were you were you, how long were you there? Let's start with that. How long were you there? Oh, uh, I, about a year in oh. Equatorial Guinea. Okay. And, so, and so in, it, sorry. So, but right. in that time, in that year, mm -hmm. how did, did you start out? Were you afraid? I mean, you're a mother. You have to be concerned about your children. Just even if most mothers are afraid if they cross the street, here you are in a, a country that's on the risk of being a war zone. So were you afraid for yourself? Were you afraid for your family, your husband? Uh, you know, I, there was a tension. Uh, I, I didn't realize how, how much tension was building up. I didn't, it was, it was strange. I didn't feel afraid. Um, we just, we were told the, all the things we should do to, um, to stay safe and to not offend anybody and not come to anyone's attention. Mm -hmm. And so we were doing all the things that we were uh, advised to do. And, um, and there was just something there was, it was surreal. And the whole time I, I, it was a bad movie. That's I, it didn't seem real. It, felt like I was living a movie and I um, I didn't think I was really terribly stressed but when we went on R&R &R and the first morning out and walking around in a free country you know people talking and laughing and an ice cream wagon and <laughs> it's just you know, all the normal life kind of thing. I got hysterical and I just started laughing and I could not stop. And uh, I realized then how much it was just stuffed inside. Yeah. Was there a moment when you were on R&R &R where you were, I don't want to go back? Or was that never, did that never occur to you? It, it never occurred to me to say I don't want to go back but I I just thought 
Okay, I have to steal myself to go back living on the tightrope. Um, you had a mission. You had a mission. You were going to complete it. Yeah, did, putting did, one foot in front of the other. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, so you were doing uh, you were doing smallpox vaccinations there, correct? That was also smallpox. Right. My did husband, you, yeah. your husband, and then did did you run into whether it was uh, vaccination hesitancy? Did you run into people who didn't want you to do the work you were doing? Were there people trying to stand in the way? How how did that work in a in a country like that at the time, especially? Yeah, uh, we we did not have that situation in northern Nigeria. Um, you know, that was, as I said, that was a Muslim area, uh, mm -hmm. the northern tier of Nigeria is Muslim. And um, so the emirs told people, you go to the vaccination sites and get vaccinated. People did not disobey the emir. Mm -hmm. The emir actually had more authority in their lives than the military governor that had been assigned assigned by the government. Mm -hmm. And um, so in other parts of Nigeria where witchcraft was more prominent, witch doctors were, they were the sources of disinformation. <laughs> uh, the, the witch doctors would, um, because this, if smallpox was gone, that really, cut into their income because they had convinced people that they could either cure smallpox or they could cause smallpox. Yeah. And so they threatened and told people that if they got vaccinated, you know, they were going to start a, an epidemic, they would spread smallpox. Um, but where we were, we didn't run into that. And then in Equatorial Guinea, Nobody even dared question anything the president said. And he felt this was good for his PR. And, you know, so he instructed people to, to get vaccinated. So we ourselves did not run into that in the areas where we were. So you were there for a year when you an equatorial again we in, were total yeah. was about two years, two years. Uh, eight months in in uh, Kano Nigeria and then a year in equatorial Guinea and then the after an incident uh the soldiers and our son our by, who by then was six the children and I were evacuated out I'm sorry we, an incident yeah, you can't just gloss over that. B. <laughs> what <laughs> happened? <laughs> I'm sure it's in the book, but it you can is, share a little. And I and I, I'm always hesitant. I think, why well, I shouldn't tell this? But, you know, people need to get the book and, and read. <laughs> uh, <laughs> drop some breadcrumbs. <laughs> um, yes, they they tried to haul him off to prison at um, six. He, yes, he was in our front yard and was making little bows and arrows with uh, bent twigs and rubber bands. And a couple of soldiers, a Guardia Nacional, were walking past the house and um, maybe thinking back to how they, what their behavior in our living room the day we unpacked, uh, jabbing their bayonets into everything. Um, mm. He, he shot this little arrow toward them. And um, so anyway, they tried to haul him off to prison and said he was make, making weapons dangerous to the Republic of Equatorial Guinea. Oh. So, uh, after that, the children and I were evacuated out to, so then we lived in Cameroon by ourselves for four months while Carl finished up. Well, he finished up. How were you able to communicate with him during those four months like telegrams and through the embassy through the um the radio um i didn't speak to him on the radio <clears throat> but he would uh the radio connection between the embassy there and the embassy and santa isabel which 
now it's Malabo is the name now, but it was sent to Isabel with the mm. cap. And um, so the, the embassies communicated with each other by radio um, and of course by diplomatic pouch. Mm. So he could send letters uh, by the diplomatic pouch. And, um, uh, but every day uh, I would walk to the embassy to see if there was any news and, um, you know, get the latest from him. How did that feel? How did, you must have been so terrified. You must, I mean, you love the guy. It's, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, how did you feel? How, what was it like on a daily basis to just wait for news? Well, it was, you know, some more tension. Um, uh, just uh, kind of being on pins and needles a lot of the time and not knowing, you know, what was going to happen there. Yeah. And, uh, and I s always assumed that he was going to be safe because the, the president was so enamored of the smallpox program um, that he, Carl was one of only two foreigners to have a letter allowing him to go anywhere in the country. And they really wanted his program. Mm -hmm. And uh, so from that standpoint, I wasn't too worried. When we were uh, back, you know, when I was in Equatorial Guinea, now that was a little different situation because he was often working, most of the time he was working on the mainland and deep in the rainforest maybe, and, um, and the children and I were at home on the island mm -hmm. and there was no communication. Um, I had no way to reach him and um, so, you know, there were times when I, I guess I'd never felt more isolated in my life because uh, the, the local people, we couldn't have anything to do with them. They couldn't speak to a foreigner or they might have been tortured or whatever. Yeah. And um, so uh, even when, one night in the middle of the night, um, they, our son was uh, having abdominal cramps and it was scary. It seemed like appendicitis. And the one doctor there said, I'm sorry, I, I'm afraid to come. I can't, I can't see you. So it, it reminds me of like North Korea in a lot of ways, because they weren't allowed to talk to you. There was limited information. Everyone was scared for their lives if they said the wrong thing. A lot of parallels. That's, yeah. that's interesting. Um, and, you know, I, I don't know a lot about North Korea. I, you know, the details like that, you know, I see, read what's going on with what they're doing with nuclear and all of that. Yeah. And, uh, but I hadn't known about the, the thing of they're not being allowed to speak to people. Oh, yeah, it's very much so. Um, you, you're not allowed to interact and there's handlers and people are afraid of what they say. I mean, it's, I mean, I guess it's any closed society. It's any place with an, a, a ruler that with an iron fist. Right. Um, after right. so after you left did you go back to the united states directly or did were there other stops no well, well i mean we stopped some on the way home just <laughs> you know uh, we spent a few days in madrid and a few days in portugal and and stopped in santa domingo and haiti and mm. then, and then uh, back to oklahoma no no in fact um when um uh, well, the public health service had had a reorganization while we were out of the country, and Carl's uh, guaranteed job had wound up in Dallas, and so... Uh, so you made it to <laughs> Dallas. Eventually, the Oklahoma made girl made it to Dallas. 
<laughs> and uh, the but the reverse culture shock that was horrible that's yeah. what i wanted to ask you about exactly what was that like to be reintroduced into the united states into into the our culture here after experiencing that so hard so hard it just seemed like all the values were upside down and and Dallas, Texas may have been one of the worst places we could have come back to uh, because most people I ran into, but like, if you could live in Dallas, why would you ever want to even go anywhere else? Yeah. I know it's not the same now, but. Um, uh, I, I still know a few people who are proud that have never left their state. Yeah. There are people like that who That's don't believe true. in passports. Like, yeah. I don't need a passport. And, and then. Um, um the grocery stores i mean who needs a whole aisle of cereal who needs 25 different kinds of toothpaste yeah um and it it just it seemed so like the consumerism was uh so difficult and and um the conversation you know if you got together with some people it, Oh, you know, my drapes or my, my sofa or whatever. And not, not that it was all like that, but that's the way it seemed. Yeah. It seemed like, it seemed like all the conversation was about such inconsequential things. And you come from a situation where there's just life and death things going on all around you. Mm -hmm. It just seems like um you're and other people are ready for you to get back to normal before you're able uh, to do that and it gave you some perspective because you were able to see these other lives and what's important right. not all 25 different kinds of toothpaste yes right you know? i mean we do have to keep our teeth white yeah but you know <laughs> maybe that's a little overkill <laughs> um, but, um but you know i still want to go back to africa and um in fact before just before the pandemic i had um i had checked with the peace corps to see what their upper age limit was and they said they didn't have one but the oldest person who'd gone with them was 86 so i thought okay i still have a little time <laughs> <laughs> it could happen and then the pandemic hit so i haven't made it yet well, but um well you could go on a book tour you could go on a book tour and like uh, put that together but so that leads me to my next question what led you to writing the book how long you, how long did you work on it before it was eventually released seven years seven years eh, well seven that's not too bad years yeah how what was what was it that made you say i have to put this on paper i have to write this uh my husband passed away of brain cancer eight years ago mm. and a few months after he has passed away i when i could finally bring myself to start going through his filing cabinets and he had a bank of filing cabinets he was a paperholic and <laughs> Um, so this one drawer was all Equatorial Guinea, and I saved that to the last. I had most of most of everything. There was no longer any purpose for it, but the so I saved that. Got myself sat in my rocking chair and got a glass of tea and started just taking you know put my feet up and started reading through. And I thought I have to write this book there i have no choice i have to mm. write it he had saved um you know copies of letters we had written to people back home there were, uh cassette tape letters that wound up back with us and uh cable he had all kinds of cable traffic uh, between him and the ambassador between him and, and the state wow. department and the usaid uh his reports to cdc and um and it just had to be done. And 
so what's been the react i've seen some of the reviews and some of the statements and they're they're incredibly gushing and over overwhelmingly positive what's what's been the reaction that you've experienced when people read about your adventures it is uh, it, it's very heartwarming because oh. um nobody ever says oh yeah i read your book it's it's really well written or it's an interesting story it's always wow <laughs> i can't <laughs> believe you know or at least i could not put that book down you know i started reading one evening and i couldn't go to sleep and i oh wow um, and but the uh the comment that has meant the most to me despite all all the comments that have just have been so uh, encouraging and just heartwarming, as I said. Um, there is a woman I've just met recently here in Santa Barbara, and she's actually South Sudanese, but she, uh, her family was able to get out of South Sudan shortly mm. before she was born. So she actually was born here. And she, she has always wanted to connect, you know, with her African roots. And she's reading the book. And she told me last week, she said, the little African girl inside me feels like you have given me a gift. You have given me Africa. And I just, oh. <laughs> oh that's, that's what it's about. Well, I have, I have one more question, but before I ask the question, um, so the link to the book and your website and everything is in the show notes. I would urge everyone to go check this out, Vaccines and Bayonets. Um, it's available at Amazon, Barnes & Noble, and other places. The links are in the show notes. So everyone, go click on those. But before I let you go, I have to ask, it sounds like you and your husband worked really as a team. It sounds like you really, it didn't sound like there was a moment where he was like, no, you can't go. Or you were like, no, honey, you can't go. Was there ever a moment where one of you said that to each other? How did you work together in order to do this as a, as a team? Cause that, that's the impression I get. And I hope I'm right. Well, we had, we had both always wanted that kind of life. Uh, so there was never any discussion about, you know, there was never a moment where he was like, Nope, B you stay home. This is, no, this oh, is no. really <laughs> not at all. Not at all. And, and, and what about your kids? What did they end up? What did they grow up to, to do? Are they, did they take these experiences with them? Well, yes, yes, definitely. Our, our daughter, um, uh, and after we left Africa and, and we were back here for what, three years, four years. And then we went to Saudi Arabia for six years. So her memory, she has her whole, you know, her, her whole childhood basically was overseas. Yeah. So, um, you know, she just treasures all of that. And, and her memories of Equatorial Guinea, like the day when, we were unpacking and the soldiers were stabbing their bayonets into all our belongings and everything. You know, she's this little person. She was only two years old and very petite to boot. And so she has this little snapshot memory of boots and legs and boxes. And so, you know, there was, she never had a, any sense of threat or, now, Charles, on the other hand, has some painful memories, mm. um, but um, um, but they, you know, I think they both do treasure the, yeah. the experiences they had and the perspective it gives them. Well, six years in Saudi Arabia, there's got to be another book in that. There can't <laughs> be. <laughs> so I wait for the next one. <laughs> Oh, um, I don't think so. But uh, I'd be happy to send you a copy of, of Vaccines and Bayonets. I would love I that. Can. I would absolutely love that. Um, maybe oh. one day, next time I'm up in Santa Barbara, I will drop by and you can you can sign it. Oh, 
Great. But we'll go have, I'll, we'll come up, we'll go have lunch. Support comes from the History's Trainwrecks podcast that focuses on stories like a temper tantrum that changed history, the president who promised not to run again and regretted it for the rest of his life, the World War II general who lost his pants on a secret mission in enemy territory. The History's Trainwrecks podcast, available now. Thanks for listening, everyone. Your support means everything. Please like, subscribe, comment, and share the show. Check out my Substack. The links are in the show notes. And I'll see you next time on The Open Highway. For the highways of America, which for so many years were an assortment of as many designs and pavements as there were states, are now becoming one big road that can take you anywhere faster, safer, and more directly than ever before. What is this big road? Where is it going? How much has been built? How much is yet to come? These are questions we ask. Certainly traveling the entire system would be a memorable experience, but few of us have the time for such a trip.